All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will do my best along with you to stay awake after lunch here. So um, there are a couple things on the front of the stage. Um, there's one really big, inconveniently sized handout. Um, that we won't spend a lot of time going through that. That's just for your reference. We'll, we'll mention it once. And then I also have, and I'll talk about more about this in a second, the books on gender identity that the, that the Seattle School District is integrating into their curriculum, um, which for our church is what kind of started our, our journey into all of this. So um, I'll talk, I'm going to read just a little segment out of one um, in our time together. Um, and I'd really encourage you just to get your hands and just flip through it. Um, so um, we'll just introduce ourselves briefly first. My name is Eric. Um, I'm the kids pastor at Westgate Chapel. Been there for the last five years. Love it. Um, Melissa, you want to introduce yourself? I'll let everybody pull rid of your name. Yeah, and my name is Melissa. I'm a licensed uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner, which means I can diagnose and prescribe medications for people with um, mental illness. And part of that prescriptive authority that I have, um, I'm specializing in, ch in child and adolescent psychiatry, that prescriptive authority that I have allows me to write prescriptions for kiddos and adults who would like to transition genders. So I, um, you know, I, as, as a children's pastor and as a practitioner, we've both kind of had to look into this and, you know, how do you navigate the uh, theological ethics of this and also how do you hold somebody who's, who doesn't know who they are? So um, even on the slide behind us, uh, this has been a recent learning thing for me, even understanding some of the terms that seem to change so often um, in this conversation. Part of my fear in this, and I'm, I'll talk about this a little further, is that I'm going to say the wrong thing that will offend somebody um, because I don't want to start a conversation with offense. Um, I, I want to I be able to sit down and, and have a genuine conversation. So, Melissa, can you unpack for us even a little bit kind of what the broad term of gender identity means? Yeah, so, um, so it would be delusional, okay, clinically delusional for somebody to believe that um, a penis and a vagina don't work the same, right? It, it would be absolutely delusional. I know, you get nervous huh, when I say this. Okay, um, but the LGBTQ community is not delusional in that sense, right? They know that there is an, a, a, a difference between male typical anatomy and female typical anatomy, okay? And so the workaround for that is they have to call that, that is your, that is your natal sex, right? That your anatomy, that's what you were born with, okay? Uh, it, what we, so the workaround for that then is gender identity where you have to um, look at what do you feel on the inside, okay? Um, that, that is where we have to separate sex from gender identity, okay? Gender identity is what do you feel on the inside? It may not match up what you have anatomically on the outside. That's, that was a helpful realization for me, just so as I try to get some handles on this conversation. Um, as I mentioned briefly before, on this workshop is an extraordinarily condensed version of a parent forum we did for parents at our church um, that I have all the resources for for something you'd be curious to do at your church. We'll give you everything, all of our notes. Um, but uh, it started with the concern of these books that are on the edge of the stage being introduced to our kindergarten and elementary schools in the Seattle School District. Um, so far to my reading, that's the extent. It's not a statewide thing. It's just in the um, Seattle School District. These are books that they... Um, that have wanted to bring in. And from my reading, they're on a trial basis this school year and are slowly kind of expanding. So they're not at all the elementary schools. They're at some of them. Um, and uh, it, um, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, the thing that I've had to wrestle with in all of this personally is the fear that I've come to the table with on this issue on many, many fronts. Um, I was, um, uh, the mandate to do this event for our families came from our senior pastor. So at, at one level, as um, a leader in ministry, I was afraid, having really not a good idea of even where I, like as I'm trying to come to terms with all these um, things, this conversation of gender identity, and you want me to like talk to people like I know what I'm doing? Uh, okay, that's terrifying. Um, and to add to that, 
um, my fear of, um, it's kind of my irrational fear on the subject, but that there is something, um, our church is in Edmonds, which is, um, you know, in the epicenter of the metropolitan Seattle area. It's about maybe 30 minutes north of downtown Seattle. And so my fear is that I, I might say something or do something as a children's pastor interacting with a family or a child in the community that would get our church persecuted online, like on Facebook. And so that's a fear that I've carried around. Um, my fear also is that just being someone who doesn't like conflict, I don't like being in conflict with other people. My fear is that even somebody, a relative stranger, it makes me uncomfortable to be in conflict with them. So just the way my personality is wired, uh, I, I have uh, in, I've treaded so lightly on this subject to the point of like, maybe if I just like kind of, uh, kind of avoid it, it'll go away, which is what has landed the church in this spot. We're like 30 years late to this conversation. We've got a lot of ground to cover, and there's a lot of fear in us, in me still, um, uh, on how do, how, do, how do I express what I believe to be true, fundamentally true, to someone? How do I sit across the table from someone who believes something fundamentally different from what I do and show them the love of God? Um, so that's something that, that we'll talk about a little bit. But I think that's the elephant in the room that we have to address for a moment. So if I could ask you, um, and maybe you're just kind of getting the ball rolling on this subject. Maybe you have families in your church wrestling with this. But if I could just ask you just to take a moment right now and to self-identify what some of your fears are. Because if you never take that moment and say, okay, what am I bringing to, from my side of the conversation into this? The th scary thing about fear is that it leaves us in a constant place of um, fight or flight in conversations. So I think what happens a lot of times is we get a little, um, militant is a pretty strong word, but it's all that I can think of. We get a little encamped on our values and beliefs, which we absolutely believe to be true, or we avoid it altogether. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight or I'm going to flee, and that removes entirely my ability to listen and removes my ability to have empathy and to sit with people in their brokenness and to sit in my own brokenness, right? I think it's so hypocritical for me to um, look at someone who is wrestling with matters of gender identity and have, it's the log and the splinter, right? Say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not broken, right? I'm married to a woman and this is great. This is my, I'm normal and I'm good. Um, and to judge their brokenness when in different ways, it's like if my right leg is broken and Melissa's left leg is broken, I say, ha ha, your left leg is broken and She's trying to make sense of the two. I have to realize that I come to the table on this discussion um, broken too. Um, and I need the Lord. I need the Lord in my sexuality as much as anyone else does. Um, and I think that's a really good place to start um, on this. So, um, Melissa, would you talk a little bit from your perspective, things that you've seen um, to kind of answer that who am I question that you'll, you'll kind of share with us? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that's really the dilemma that, that we all, if you're in leadership, that we all kind of find um, a tension between, right? How do I hold the reality of somebody's brokenness uh, with the real, and, and keep the integrity of our theology? And uh, so I want to kind of present a little case study here. Um, I want to be careful because I don't want us to get pigeonholed into believing that that as I share this story, that this is everybody's story because it's not true. Um, you, you have to you you have to engage people on the terms of the relationship, right? And so there are some things that are going to catch everybody, and some that won't. So um, I had a patient uh, come into the pediatric clinic, uh, born a female, transitioned to male, uh, had went through all of the hormone replacement therapy and had a double mastectomy, um, which is what we call top surgery. So um, he had top surgery done. I just want to clarify, I, uh, I, I, pronouns aren't pr the preferred pronouns. It's not a hill I'm willing to die on. Because if I have 30 minutes to an hour with a patient, I'm going to drive straight to the heart of the matter. I don't care what you want to be called, because I'm going to call on the creator who knows you by name, not by your genitalia. So, so don't get into that argument, call them whatever they want to be called by, because you know the God that sees past that. Um, so this, um, this kid had a double mastectomy, 
called top surgery, did not have what we call bottom surgery, still had um, anatomically a vagina, uh, and came in. I've never seen a kid exhibit so much depression uh, to the, and shame to the point that he would not look up, like, like would not even look up. And myself and the consulting psychiatrist were trying to determine whether to send this kid to the hospital from the clinic because he had made a plan to go and kill himself. But it, and luckily, by the grace of God, even though this kid didn't believe in God, uh, he came to this clinic to get help. It was very brave, very brave. Uh, so it comes in, and I remember the only time... Um, that this kid looked up. He looked up at me and he goes, can you just tell me who I am? I, I have to tell you, I had a burning, burning knot in my throat because it, it was everything in me to keep from leaping over into that chair and wrapping my arms around this kiddo and saying, you were not protected. You were not protected and you had to make adult decisions that you are not ready for. Now, I had permission from this patient, right? I could say to him, you were born with female anatomy, and therefore, you should just be female. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. It doesn't work that way. If it was that simple, he wouldn't have gone through and had his breast removed, right? He wouldn't have gone through and had all of the hormone replacement. So what do we do with this? Um, so, so where do we start? Where does, and, and I should, should qualify this a little bit, this patient um, was severely sexually abused uh, as a little one, um, also had gone through uh, severe emotional and physical abuse, was homeless. And so there were a lot of factors in this. Where does trauma stop in this kiddo's life and where does sin start? I have no idea, right? I have no idea. They probably are so tightly wound that how can you, unless you are God, separate out, no, this is a trauma response and this is sin. I can't answer that. Which if I can jump in on yes. that, if you can just write this down in your notes, we don't have time to talk about it at length, but write down ACEs, A-C-E-S, that's an acronym for Adverse Childhood Experiences, which um, the short version is, um, uh, how, and it actually came from a medical setting because they realized the connection between trauma and health outcomes. I mean, like chronic illnesses, length of life. Um, we, uh, I mean, uh, as a kids pastor, until recently, until I learned about child, adverse childhood experiences, which is the negative side of the coin, and then the positive side of the coin, which we as kids pastors and leaders um, who are secure attachments in the lives of kids, consistent relationships every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Tuesday. They see us, we're safe, we're loving, that's a secure attachment, right? And kids need multiple secure attachments, especially kids who don't have that at home. Um, so uh, just, just Google that and you'll see a wealth of stuff. Um, Bethany Christian Services in Seattle does an excellent, I don't know how often they do it, they do an excellent like Saturday workshop. It's, um, it's free worth an email to them, say, hey, when are you doing that next? I'd like to come. They talk through the impact of trauma on kids and how you can add more trauma-informed care. It's something that I went and um, we, we took right to our volunteer trainings and has added a level of empathy and understanding when we have these kids who are, have really difficult presenting behaviors um, and uh, gives us a measure of understanding as to why. Um, so I'll, I'll just make that encouragement to us as, as kids leaders to get an idea of trauma in the lives of these kids. Yeah, Tammy. ACEs, Adver oh, Bethany Christian Services um, in Seattle. Um, I don't think so. Is Rylan in here? No, I, I think they're totally, totally, totally disconnected. But Adverse Childhood Experiences, ACEs, just Google that and you'll see a wealth of stuff. So, sorry, continue. No, 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 that was so good. I'm, I'm always for the ACE training. Um, so, uh, how, how do we navigate this theologically? And the, the reason why we're here, the reason why we are having this discussion is because of Genesis chapter 3. When you share the story of Adam and Eve, um, you are sharing the story of where everything went wrong in this world. And 
I have changed the way that I diagnose, I changed the way that I treatment plan uh, with patients based off of Genesis chapter three because it's one of the most comprehensive views of the human condition that you can get more so than secular psychiatry. It's filled in the blanks for secular psychiatry. And so when people say, okay, you're telling me that I'm confused about my gender because Adam and Eve ate a piece of fruit, the answer is with head held hide with 100% confidence, oh, absolutely. And let me tell you why this is the most logical thing you will ever begin to understand. Um, Genesis chapter 3, and I have pulled this apart quite a bit because I've had to study where, where, where does stuff go wrong in people's lives, right? It, people are coming to me for pills to help them get better, but there has to be a fundamental world view change, right? Um, I can't give a pill for hope. Um, I wish I could. I can make a lot of money. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I apologize. We have to go pretty quickly through this, but there's a lot in Genesis chapter 3. But I'm just going to focus on this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 uh, and 7. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they um, sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is why we are having this discussion, okay? Remember, only good things were put in the garden. God did not put a porn shop in the middle of the garden and say, don't be tempted. God did not put a bar in the middle of the garden and say, don't be tempted. But we have taken this conversation and we have put sexuality in the middle of the garden and say, don't be tempted. God did not put that in the middle of the garden. He put good things. He put necessary things. The tree was good. That's what scripture says. The tree was necessary for, for life. The, the tree was necessary for food. But where it goes wrong, where it goes wrong is in every single human being. I have to tell you, I see this in every psychiatric hospital I've been to. When I sit in groups, um, you, can just, you can just see it written all over people. Uh, so you take a good thing, you take a necessary thing, but she saw that it was desirable for gaining wisdom. She turned that, that good thing, that necessary thing, into a God itself and said, if I have this piece of fruit from this tree, then I will have wisdom, instead of looking to the one who can give her wisdom. And that's, that's why we're having this discussion, right? Gender is a good thing. We have research on it. We know that gender is a good thing. Gender is a necessary thing. But when you take your gender, your maleness, your femaleness, or any identity in between, and you elevate that to the place, and you say, I must have this type of identity, you have now turned that thing into a god. That's where it goes wrong. That's where we as leaders have to say, you want healing, you have to dismantle the idol. So let's go back to this case study. Because what do I do with this kid? He gave me permission, basically, to tell him, sure, I will uh, we'll stop the hormones, we'll send you back into surgery, you can get breast implants, and you, be, you can become a female again. I, one of the things that I pray during my time with patients is, Father, would you expose the idol? Would you show me what good thing, what necessary thing in this child's life have they elevated to the wrong place? And look to and said, if I have this, then I'll finally be something. That gives us a different place to start other than sexuality. Because it's probably not the problem. Right? I could tell this kid, like I said earlier, go back in for surgery. Let's, let's get you back to female status. And let me tell you, it wouldn't fix the problem. He wasn't happy as a female. He wasn't happy as a male. Maybe it's not to do anything with sexuality and gender. So as I was sitting in here, I'm, I'm praying that God would expose the idol, would show me. And all of a sudden, there were just like these specific phrases that this kid kept using. And it was related to beauty. It was related to being wanted. And I go, that's the idol. That is a good thing to want to be beautiful. 
a necessary thing, right, to have a beauty. Uh, it was created by God. But when you take beauty and you elevate that, as this kid did, he wasn't beautiful enough as a female. He wasn't beautiful enough as a male. And therefore, this, this kid had put all of his hope in the beauty, and it didn't come through for him because beauty will never die for you. Beauty will always demand more and more and more from you. So if a child like this came into your congregation, it would be detrimental to say, you know what, let's just, let's dress you up in girls' clothes and let's get you back to how you were born because it wasn't the problem. We can't start with sexuality. The Bible doesn't even start that way. It doesn't start with, in the beginning, God created a man and a woman. It starts with, in the beginning, God. You have to start outside of yourself in order to find yourself. The place that I... Um until it actually wasn't until last night i think yesterday i woke up just with this thought on my mind and i have wrestled and will continue to wrestle and i think that first of all a willingness on my part to step in to this into a something that scares me something that i don't understand something that is very politically tense especially in the place that i live and minister but my willingness to say okay god and to step into this issue because the care that I have for these people who are hurting and confused and broken in different ways than I am, um, that's, that's where the love of God begins. Um, and and the, thing, the thing that I've wrestled with and wrestled with is um, so many times with, in my friend groups, even with ministerial colleagues, um, this subject comes up. And it always seems to end with a unanimous, unanimous agreement around the table. We need to sh show them Christ's love. Yeah, that's good. All right. Okay, where are we going for lunch? Um, and that seems to satisfy in us that urge. I think the Holy Spirit's poking, saying, hey, you, you, need, you need to wrestle with this a little bit. right? You, you, the image of God that is resident in people who are struggling with these issues is worth your time, is worth your worry, is worth you going to war with your fears is worth you spending a Saturday to get trauma-informed, is worth you seeking out, etc., so forth. And you, you guys are here because of that. I'm here because of that. But um, for me, I, I didn't, if somebody asked me truly, genuinely, Eric, how, how do I love someone who was born male and is transitioned to female? How do I love somebody who I fundamentally disagree with? And for me, that answer is to listen to them. And I have to do that first and foremost. Before I, before I go to my Bible and pull some scriptures, before I go to a commentary, before I go to notes from a fusion workshop I went to, I have to respect and love the image of God in them enough to sit down across the table from them, somebody who I disagree with, somebody who may be argumentative, somebody may, who may be combative. But if, if I'm honest, that's my fear talking. Because most of these people are, would be sitting down across the table from me just as afraid as I am because they've been hurt by people in the church who've been unwilling to listen. And that has severed a relationship and a connection to the Lord that they need. The most chilling thing to me on this subject is the passage that talks that says, if you can't love your brother or sister who you can see, how can you say you can love God? And, and there's not, there isn't a, a qualifying statement. It, it doesn't say, if you can't love your brother or sister in Christ in the church, in your small group, who you can see, no. It's, it's a universal, if you cannot love your brother or your sister, if you can't show love to every single human being on the planet in some way, how can you say you love God? And that's a chilling thing for me to wrestle with because I, 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 I'm kind of realizing, even now, even having wrestled with that, I still feel ill-equipped Ill um, to come to the table. But the best thing, my dad, my, God bless my dad. I'm so thankful to have a father that I have a good relationship with. Um, one of the gems of wisdom that he dropped, it's like he said at one time and it stuck with me. Um, he said, seek to understand before you try to be understood. And if I can carry that with me into these conversations, I believe for me and maybe for you too, that is the most loving Christ-like thing that I can do. I don't have all the answers. They don't have all the answers, but a demonstrated willingness for me to zip my lip 
to get a little hot under the collar and uncomfortable with the way that they might be living their life, the things that they're saying, and just say, you know what? You're a valuable, important human being. I'm sorry for anything that anybody has said from my position or the position at the church that has hurt you, that has made you feel like you are less than or fill in the blank. I really, I don't understand, but I want to try. I want to try. Could you unpack kind of what you had talked about, love versus friendliness? Yeah. Um, So back to the conversations with my friends before we figure, okay, okay, where are we going for lunch? Um, I think until this point in my life, to people in this demographic, my version of showing them the love of Christ was friendliness, was being, was smiling at them, and um, yeah, that, that's about as far as I got. But friendly, friendliness isn't love. That, that's, that's a blanket courtesy that is just like, people can be friendly and be a Satanist, right? Friendliness is not godliness, right? Um, and so, I well, sure, certainly, we need to be friendly and loving on face value, but these issues are more than face value. So, just my willingness to sit. And, and for me, for my context as a ministry leader, to, to sit who is in some, in, is in, if someone's willing to sit down with me on this subject, it means that they at some degree are willing to listen to my input and at some degree are seeking what the Lord would think and what the Lord would say, God help me, but if I can sit down with them and go past the friendliness, go past just the, the greeting and say, man, I don't, or how about this, flip it on its head, if I seek them out, if I seek them out, and I, and, I go, and I go to somebody who wouldn't normally talk to me or wouldn't normally come in the church to say, hey, you know what? Um, uh, I work at a church, a pretty conservative church, um, and I just want to understand. I just want to understand. Melissa, would you, would you talk about when you presented um, w- what the result was from your presentation? So my um, thesis for my graduate uh, degree was um, exposing Argo, how, um, Christi- how theology and psychiatry misunderstand each other and how we can come together and improve outcomes. And so I presented a lot of the conversations that I've been having with the LGBTQ community. I went to Seattle U, high, high population. It's on Capitol Hill. A majority of the students there are LGBTQ community. And so um, there were quite a few of those students within my, um, my thesis uh, presentation. And as I was presenting, um, essentially in a roundabout, maybe more mm, um, more uh, medical terms, I guess, or uh, how Christianity is actually for them, um, there were people that were crying within the uh, presentation, going, I never thought Christianity was like this. Um, when we just, exactly that, when we sit and listen, we can we can start to meet them on their terms, um, and we can, uh, I guess, discover kind of where they're coming from, and you, in that you can, um, well, let me just tell the story. So <laughs> I'm I'm getting ahead of myself here. So just a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to sit with a uh, patient. This was a born a female born a male, transitioned to female. Uh, she had jumped off of the freeway, uh, jumped off of the I-5 corridor onto the freeway. Uh, and it was an incomplete suicide, which means that she had survived. And uh, so we had to have patient monitors in there to make sure that she didn't hurt herself. And I walked in and sat down with this patient and right off the bat, she said, 
um, she, she goes, I don't, the other nurse that came in here, I don't even want to talk to them because they just started talking to me about God. And it was so random because it, it's, it's Harborview. It's a trauma hospital. It's not, we're, we're not a religious affiliated hospital. And so I'm going, okay, I need to pay attention to this. Like you just kind of blasted me with some stuff. I'll go there. Um, and so <laughs> I, I sat down and I said, okay, let's, let's start to have this conversation. And uh, she said, you know, I don't believe in a God. I truly believe that we came from aliens, which it comes more from like the Stephen Hawking type of, um, of philosophy and had been very read up on this. And so as we started to have this conversation, I didn't, I didn't have to preach at <laughs> this person. Just listening to the statements that she had of of where he come from and and so then my questions changed okay so so you have to convince me that you're not going to go jump off of another uh freeway right if we're going to let you out of the hospital so tell me where do you draw your hope from well i don't know well tell me i mean if you truly believe that we came from aliens right what hope are they giving you and so as we progress through this conversation, remember, I'm not telling them anything about Scripture. She didn't want to hear anything about Scripture. The last whoever it was had come in and ruined the whole thing. If we just listen, listen to their words, listen to their words and ask them, draw them out. And by the, the end, it was a couple hours, and by the end of, of our time together, she was asking for churches that she could go to that could help her discover her identity. It naturally comes out. Just listen. Just listen. Um, when you presented your thesis, um, uh, correct me if I'm misremembering this, there, uh, your presentation chair cried, and there was a, was it a lesbian couple? Yeah. A lesbian couple came up to you and said, um, we, we, we fundamentally disagree on this, but we would attend your church mm -hmm. simply because it really, we're so amazed that the church would care enough to try to understand. Yeah, and I've actually heard that quite a bit. Thank you yeah. for reminding me. Uh, I've actually heard that quite a bit from people within the LGBTQ community. Even if they attend a church that doesn't find homosexuality, trans, uh, the transgender discussion biblically tenable, they would still attend because at least, at least they are treated like a whole human being. Yeah. A lot of the churches that are open and affirming, and this is the, the conversations that, the feedback I've heard from people within the LGBTQ community, is that, is that there's so much focus on their sexuality and there's so much focus that they, all of a sudden it's like, all the church is focusing on is my sexuality. But I'm more than that. I, I'm more than my genitalia. I am more than, than my, my identity. And so they would rather come to a church that does not find this issue biblically tenable because they are treated like a whole person. We need to take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, I want to try to leave a little bit of time for us to just kind of interact and dialogue a little bit. Um, I'm going to shift gears just briefly. Um, in the, uh, uh, just to give you an, uh, hopefully share with you a lesson that you can learn from me instead of having to learn it by yourself. Um, to finish my thought about how all this came about at our church and how we kind of put on this um, parent forum um, for parents. Um, when I first heard about the books that were um, being introduced into the school system, um, I, it was like fourth hand news by the time I got to me. Our senior pastor had heard about it from somebody and then it kind of like, I was like the fourth person to get it. And what happens when there are um, sensitive issues, every, when you, the more people, the, the longer the food chain, the more filters get added to it. So that by the time it had gotten to me, it was like a, uh, uh, all right, we got to start a Christian school. We got to pull all of our kids out of schools. We, how are we going to do this? It was like a frenetic, like, ah! 
Yeah, and you, like it was so when we first sat down, Melissa and I, and a couple of the other pastors um, and and uh, lay people within the church, we sat down to put our heads together for this conference, and we just felt even in us, it was almost this tangible presence of fear in the room. Like we were so afraid to like, how do we do this? How do we? We were just so afraid. Um, but <laughs> what happened when I went to the source? So when I pawed through the Seattle School District website and I ordered all the books. I say, you know what? I, 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 I need to read the books. Let me, let me figure out what this really is. It wasn't so scary. And let me share, you what, share with you what I mean. The older books get more, um, are, get, become more detailed and more off of what we would say is true and is God's design. But this is, and I'd encourage you to address your own fear. If you uh, are ministering in the Seattle School District, come open these books up and scan some pages, order them yourself, okay? Because I think even, even handing, and I have them in my office so that if and when I have a meeting with a parent who's like, Eric, what do I do? I'm like, you know what? I don't know. Read the book first and buy it and read it with your kid at home before they get it at school because you have the chance. So we, the wonderful thing about kids' ministry, it's the one area of ministry where we get to be proactive instead of reactive. So we have the chance to build in the, the word the, and the truth of God into the lives of these kids before they get confronted with it. The, the tension is it's way before we're ready to do it. If you're a parent and if you scan through the sexual integrity um, timeline, that's a resource from Orange Curriculum. I have a PDF of that so you don't have to go digging for it. I'll give you my email at the end of this. I can send it to you. Um, that starts at like two to three years old by using the um, clinical terms for genitalia. Um, and... Uh, for, we don't have time to get into the, the benefits of that, um, but uh, by reading the book myself, I realized this book is a paraphrase, is what we would want, the way we would want our kids. Let me read three pages and you'll see what I mean. So this is, this is what's taught in, in some, of the, some kindergarten, um, kindergarten schools, kindergarten schools uh, at the kindergarten grade level, um, and it's about a, um, a boy and his teddy bear and I'll just skip to kind of the core of the story, which when I, I, I could feel it coming, and I was like, I was like bracing myself to be offended when I first read this. But here's what the book says. Um, uh, it says, oh no, even the, essentially Teddy's having a hard day and his, his friend's trying to figure out why. Oh no, even the swing isn't working. What's wrong, Thomas? Talk to me. Thomas is the teddy bear. If I tell you, said Thomas, you might not be my friend anymore which is the very real fear of kids in our spheres of influence, grade school kids, that's the fear. If I'm different on anything, right, not just matters of gender identity, right, if I'm taller, shorter, right, heavier, lighter, right, if I'm different in any way, I'm going to get bullied and picked on, right? Um, and his friend says, I'll always be your friend, Thomas. Thomas the Teddy took a deep breath and said, I need to be myself, Errol. In my heart, I've always known that I'm a girl, Teddy, not a boy, Teddy, I wish my name was Tilly, not Thomas. And I was like, when I turned this page, I was like, okay, here we go. Teaching this to kindergartners. And then I realized they're teaching them the Christian response. Is that why you've been so sad, Earl asked? I don't care if you're a girl, Teddy, or a boy, Teddy. What matters is that you're my friend. Isn't that the love of God? To be able to see people's tension and struggle and say, man, that sounds really tough. I'm not going to go anywhere. It doesn't change the value I see in you. It doesn't change the value that you have in God's eyes. Just because you're going through this doesn't mean you're not made in the image of God anymore. Are you kidding me? No. No, in fact, I, I love you even more, and I'm grateful that you would trust me enough as your friend to be honest with me about this. So by reading this book, a lot of my fear, by going right to the source... And that's what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that we, we go to the source. Don't get it secondhand. Don't listen to someone who says, oh, I heard that in the whatever school year, in this school district, in this school. Go to the source. And we've seen a number of parents have gotten proactively involved on the days when um, this has been introduced into the, into the classroom. And um, actually, our worship pastor's wife, they kind of rolled up their sleeves and they said, you know what? We're going to embrace this timeline. We're going to embrace um, this idea that um, I want my kids to hear this from me first. It's way sooner than I'm ready to talk, have this conversation with them, but the value of them hearing 
from it from me first. I just last just I just sat in uh, the Generation Z work Z I think workshop with Micah Kruger. Watch that because that has bearing on the subject we're having now. Es essentially, one of the connections is that kids' values are not being shaped by their parents anymore. They're being shaped by the culture around them. They're being shaped by YouTube, right, by their friends at school. So even if it's before we're willing and ready to get involved with the, our kids on this issue and encourage our parents and our churches to say, this is, you're not ready for this. This is way sooner than you thought you'd have to have this conversation. But if you want your kids, if you want to have an open conversation, an open and ongoing conversation with your kids on this issue, it's got to start now. It's got to start now. And so that, that guideline gives some really specific and practical ways that you can do that and encourage your kids, um, parents in that way. Um, yeah, let's do that. Um, I'm going to pop just because I have an insanely long email and last name. E. Brennicky at Westgate Chapel, it doesn't even fit on one line. Um, so if you, so let me share briefly the resources that we have that I can send you and then we'll just open it up for questions and conversations. So um, I have uh, a list of the books um, and the grades that they're taught in. I have our notes from a three hour workshop we did with two breakout sessions, one for um, kids, well, parents of kids preschool through elementary and one for parents of kids high school on up. Um, and all of our notes and our graphics. So um, if this is something you would even want to do in a small group, I'll, I'll send it all to you. Um, we also compiled, we also have the proposal that we wrote um, uh, as we presented this to our senior pastor to do this, a list of vocabulary terms um, that Melissa has put together just so you can um, learn the language of people who are wrestling with these issues. And um, we have a five-page document that we, we personally reviewed and compiled resources for parents in our church on this topic. Um, Focus on the family um, has some pretty comprehensive ones, a lot of other articles, some book recommendations. Um, this, is just, this is just my, uh, my bias, but having wrestled through a lot of fear, um, it has, on this issue and myself, has made it so that I think I can see it clearly in written material and articles and different things. Um, and, just, and this is just me, this is just Eric speaking, but in some of the focus on the family stuff, um, there was um, uh, some language of fear in there um, and almost a little militant. Um, so I only say that to say, um, review some of this yourself because you'll benefit for it before you offer it to the families in your church. What we reviewed for our church and our families we felt like was appropriate for them, but you might have a different level for your own church. Um, so review it for yourself. There's hyperlinks so you don't have to like Google search URLs this long. But um, if you want that, just send me an email. That's my email right there. Um, and say, hey, give me the resources you mentioned in your workshop and I'll, I'll email it off to you. So, with that being said, um, workshop's supposed to be done at 2, but we've got a little bit of a break if we want to push until, I think, 2.15 when the next workshops are. So, um, l l let's just, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, so, questions, comments? Um, yes, sir. Oh, uh, I'll, uh, we'll slide off to the side here so you can... So you can get that. And I'll leave it up even through, through the end. So if you want to just like take a picture of it or kind of get it, that's about as far as we can, as we can go here. So um, yeah, I'll leave it up. So um, questions, in, input on this, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. For me personally, how I would handle that, first of all, if you haven't had it yet, um, because I fall under the authority of my senior pastor, have this conversation with your senior pastor and or whatever leadership you're under, say, Hey, has it, have we thought through this as a church? Like, how do we handle this? So that you are falling under the, the authority and the direction of your senior pastor. Um, how I personally would handle that, um, I, would, um, I would probably say to that person, um, that's a great question. Um, I'm, 
awesome that you would call and ask about that. That is a subject that is so misunderstood and misconstrued by people that I would love the opportunity to take you out to coffee and talk more about it. Um, I don't know that I can, that I can um, talk about that subject in, in the most honoring way or the way, uh, I'm, I'm grabbing, well, you kind of caught me off guard, offhand here, so I'm trying to, um, essentially to communicate to them, I care about the subject enough that I don't want there to be any room for misunderstanding and I really value the chance to build, build a connection with you. And, and maybe there's even opportunity to say there, hey, that's a great question. Um, you know, why are you asking? Um, and, not, and not in a, like a combative way, just a, hey, help me, help me understand where you're coming from. Like, what's, what's the context? Like, um, you know, uh, yeah. But I, I try to get face-to-face -face with them. I get into this discussion quite a bit, not from a uh, pastoral standpoint, but as a, as a Christian, a lot of my um, colleagues really like to ask and challenge. And so I really like to pull the conversation away from sexuality because it's not what it's about, right? So when somebody says to me, Do, you know, what is your stance on this? My automatic response is, well, wrong question. We can't start there. Because by asking you that question, what they're requiring you to do is to hand them a book, open to page 67, and say, just tell me everything on this book, or on this page, when, and you should be caught up to the point of the story, you should know the author, you should love the author, you should trust the author, when in reality, they may not even believe that there is an author. And so that question is an unfair, it's a lose-lose question for you. And so the, the way that, that, for me, how I handle it is to pull us away from that because we can't start there. If you don't believe that there is a God who has established a straight line in, in law or whatever, then all of our other discussions are, are worthless. Why does it matter to you? But if there is a God, right, we don't start with in the beginning was a man and a woman, right? We start with in the beginning God. And so that's where I would, I would say, well, maybe we're starting in the wrong place because, um, you know, this, <laughs> we're, it, it'll pull you down a, a wrong path. Um, because it's an unfair question. It, there, it's requiring you to answer yes or no. And that's where we have to dig into scripture, right? Anytime Jesus was backed into a corner and given only one or two options, he always used the gospel as the third way out. And so that's where you've got to pull in the gospel and go, hey, wait a minute. Well, where are we starting from? That's a great question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I flat out, because what I find is when, and because uh, I'm around some pretty, <laughs> some pretty intense uh, people within the LGBTQ community, and we like to banter back and forth because we have relationship first, we have relationship first, we have relationship first, and so we can press at each other. When somebody asks that question, do you believe that, that trans people are going to go to hell? Do you believe that so-and-so is in sin? That is... I, in my experience, I have found that that is not, it's not a real question. They are trying to feel you out to see whether or not you're an ally, to see whether or not you're a safe person. And I want them to know I will be the safest person they will ever come to because we are going to, we are going to lay everything out on the table and we're going to see what sticks. Um, I, I, look, I, <laughs> when you, when you're working with people, you're working with children, you're working with their parents, you are invited into their lives in ways that other people just aren't, right? The grocery store clerk, the, you know, you're, you're just at a, you're invited into a different place. And so I want them to know, I, we are going to go deep and we're going to go deep quickly because I believe in healing. I, I believe that you are a human being and I believe in a God that calls you by your name. I think something that has helped me as I've tried to frame this is um, in a lot of the circles that I'm in, this conversation and the sin associated with this 
is elevated above all other areas of, of morality, of sexuality. It's like, oh yeah, stealing, but oh this, oh man. So um, going back to your question a little bit, how would you respond if somebody called your church and said, hey, what's your stance on divorce? It, it takes kind of some of the scariness out of the question, right? Because at some point we're talking about they, they want to know God's stance on um, your interpretation, right? The stance of truth on, on the matter and how I handle it in matters of sexual identity, and I'll handle it in matters of, I mean, marriage, or, I mean, the list goes on. I would hope that I would approach it similarly so I don't bring my frenzy and my fear to that conversation. But I would probably have time for one more. Okay. All right. Yes, yeah. thank you for asking that. <laughs> yes, it is very appropriate, and they very much appreciate that. Ask them what pronouns. Remember, it's not a hill we should die on, right? We'll, we'll get past that, okay? Uh, yes, okay, what pr pronouns do you prefer? Um, you know, tell me a little bit about your story. Um, I, I do this with patients all the time. There's times where, so um, people who are gender nonconforming, they will go by the pro pronouns they, them, their, mm -hmm. which is very confusing because it does not fit within the context of the English language, okay? And I, I screw up because, not because I'm a bigot, I yeah. screw up because I'm human and, I, and I'm just used to the, the English language, right? So I had a patient, this was just a couple weeks ago, who goes, their partner went by they, them, their, and I um, had referred to them as she, and I caught myself and I immediately apologized and said, you know what, I'll try to be more aware of that. Totally fine, everything blew over, right? Um, so I, I think, absolutely, we, we should invest in people's stories, whether they are gender nonconforming, whether they are pansexual, whether, they, whether they're heterosexual, right? We, that's, that's what church community is. We invest in their stories, and so it's absolutely appropriate. And there's times where I just come out and say it and go, look, this is all new to me, so can you please, you know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm trying yeah. to learn, but can you have a little grace on me? And I push back on my LGBTQ um, uh, colleagues to say, hey, listen, you know, ease up on the faith community. They're trying. They're, they're trying. But but when you establish this fear, right, it doesn't change behavior. It only pushes people to go silent. So you haven't changed anything, right? You, have, you haven't impacted the faith community at all. So lay off of the, I, I really push hard on my colleagues to go lay off and have some grace. You're asking for grace. Give it back. It's a, it's a standard that we can call both sides to, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. So great question. For time's sake, um, yeah, no, you're good. Um, I think we need to wrap it up to allow the next presenter to get in here. Let me just leave you with one final encouragement. I have benefited immensely from having someone, Melissa, some, uh, some colleagues I've had on staff that we did that workshop together, just to process this. Melissa and I, just as we were talking through this last night, we've probably had five or six significant conversations about this issue, and they have been totally different every time. We've had different revelations, different realizations, um, have realized different things in ourselves. So find find someone that you have, a, uh, find a safe relationship and say, hey, I feel like I really need to, to make an effort to understand this more. Will you jump into this with me? And can, you, can we just be a sounding board for each other, share articles, read a book together, whatever? Um, I think you'd uh, benefit from that as, as we have. Thanks for coming. Let me pray for you before, before we go. Um, there is no silver bullet in this. And every situation and every individual that calls us on the phone that walks into our church is going to be different, have a different story, and respond differently to how we respond to them. Um, and we can only navigate that by the, by the Holy Spirit in us. So...